Hi, my name is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast of the New Testament. I'll be using as the text the King James Version, along with the Joseph Smith Translation. Although this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort's been made to be as doctrinally accurate as possible. I'll also be using quotes from general authorities of the Church, the Apostles and Prophets, and BYU professors and others, and uh, every word out of the Scriptures themselves. So if you're ready for a really detailed analysis of the New Testament, you've come to the right place. Welcome. Hi, welcome back to this uh, New Testament podcast. This will cover um, Matthew 1, verses 18 to 25, Luke chapter 2, Matthew chapter 2. Um, And so let's go ahead and get into this because uh, we've got a lot to cover. And this will be about the birth of Jesus. So the Annunciation to Joseph, uh, we talked about last time the Annunciation to to, uh, Mary, but now we have to Joseph. All right, so Matthew 1, 18, we'll start there. Now, as it is written, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Or in the Greek it says, in this way. After his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, in other words, they weren't married yet, but were promised to each other, Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. This should be read by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's by Bruce R. McConkie. Alma says in chapter 7, Christ shall be born of Mary, she being a virgin, a precious and chosen vessel, who shall be overshadowed and conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost, and bring forth a son, yea, even the Son of God. 1 Nephi 11 reads, And it came to pass that I looked and behold the great city of Jerusalem and also other cities and I beheld the city of Nazareth and in the city of Nazareth I beheld a virgin and she was exceedingly fair and white and it came to pass that I saw the heavens open and an angel came down and stood before me and he said unto me Nephi what beholdest thou and I said unto him a virgin most beautiful and fair above all other virgins and he said unto me knowest thou the condescension of God and I said unto him I know not I know that he loveth his children, nevertheless I do not know the meaning the meaning of all things. <clears throat> and he said unto me, Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of the Son of God, after the manner of the flesh. And it came to pass that I beheld that she was carried away in the Spirit, and after she had been carried away in the Spirit for the space of a time, the angel spake unto me, saying, Look, and I looked and beheld the angel, the virgin again, bearing a child in her arms. And the angel said unto me, Behold, the Lamb of God, yea, even the Son of the Eternal Father. Knowest thou the meaning of the tree which thy father saw? During the espousal period, the bride-elect lived with her family or friends, and all communication between herself and her promised husband was carried on through a friend. So I have a question. Did Joseph believe in Mary's story? Verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, and not willing to make her a public example, was minded, or uh, i.e. he desired to to release or divorce her secretly, to put her away privily. He could have have brought her before a public trial at which she could have been sentenced to death. That was what the law in Deuteronomy would would require. He chose the most merciful way of dealing with the situation. He was truly a kind and gentle and forgiving person. Joseph, however, did not believe Mary because he was going to divorce her. Elder McConkie said, We may well suppose that Mary told Joseph of her condition, that she then went to Elizabeth, that Joseph struggled with his problem for nearly three months, being fully tested, that Gabriel brought the word, that Joseph sent word to Mary of his conversion, and that she returned again in haste and joy, that immediately the second part of the marriage ceremony was performed, and that Joseph, to preserve the virginity of the one who bore God's child, refrained from sexual associations with her until after Jesus had come forth as her child. Verse 20, But while he thought on these things, in other words, Joseph wrestled with this problem, the Greek word translated as thought in the King James Version more properly conveys agonized. He had decided to divorce her in private when the angel gave him instructions. Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a, in a vision, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she, brought, and she, shall, bring, and she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. President Nelson, in a talk at BYU in 2002, said, 
Mary and Joseph did not need to be taught the deep significance of the name Jesus. The Hebrew root from which it was derived, Yahashua, means Jehovah is salvation. So the mission of Jehovah, soon to be named Jesus, was salvation and his supreme de destiny was to become the savior of the world. Continuing verse 21, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this took place, that all things might be fulfilled which were spoken of the Lord by the prophets, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, awakened out of his vision, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife. They finished the marriage ceremony by promptly taking Mary as his wife. Under Jewish law, he was acknowledging the child as his own. Therefore, there was no need for adoption because Jesus became the legal legitimate son of Joseph. Remember that we had already the, the uh, genealogy of Jesus uh, through Joseph, and that was because he was his foster father, but also uh, le legitimate uh, under Jewish law. Verse 21, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and they called his name Jesus. All right, now let's go to Luke chapter 2. Uh, Caesar's tax is the first thing that we mention here in chapter 2, uh, verse 1. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all his empire should be taxed or enrolled or registered. This same taxing was when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Elder Talmadge said, This census was the second of three such general registrations recorded by historians as occurring at intervals of about 20 years. Elder Russell M. Nelson at a BYU devotional, the one I just mentioned, also said, This was really a capitation tax, a census, an enrollment, a registration of the citizenry of the Empire of Rome. Herod made a decision that people should be counted in the land of their ancestors. Mary and Joseph, then living in Nazareth, had to travel southward to the city of David, a distance approximately as far as from Salt Lake City to Nephi. Perhaps they traveled even farther if they went around the hostile intermediate province of Samaria. Almost certainly they traveled with relatives who likewise were summoned to the land of their ancestry. This difficult travel was no doubt made with their animals, such as dogs and donkeys. They likely camped out several nights as three to four, three to four days uh, would have been required for that journey. It could have taken as long as 10 days. It just depends on uh, what was going on. Although the tax did not require people to go to the place of their family origin, the Jews preferred it. Hence, Joseph and Mary both went back to the city of David, or which is also known as Bethlehem, for the census. Women were not required to go as they didn't participate. Mary probably went because she wanted Joseph's support as he knew who the child truly was and facing a difficult journey was preferred to the still lingering scandal in Nazareth. It was a difficult, treacherous journey. Now, um, also we, we often look at or think of uh, Mary as riding on a donkey and usually that really wasn't done that way. Uh, the invention or the reason that we see Mary on a donkey was mostly because of Hallmark cards that was done in the early 1900s. Uh, that's how we got uh, the idea that Mary rode on a donkey, but that's probably not how it happened. All right, uh, regarding Bethlehem and Christ's birth, beginning in verse 4, And Joseph also went up from Galilee. Now, Nazareth is in the north, but, it, but at a lower elevation than Bethlehem, hence they went up to Bethlehem. Nazareth was at about 1,800 feet in altitude, and Bethlehem was about 2,500 feet sea level. Out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And this was a trip of about 80 to 90 miles. It may have taken between 7 and 10, and ten days <clears throat> to, to make this trip. Elder McConkie said they went to Bethlehem because they had no choice, but this was only the occasion, the vehicle, the excuse, as it were, they would have moved heaven and earth, if need be, to place themselves in the city of David when the hour arrived for the coming of the son of David. We know that uh, the name Bethlehem also means house of bread, so the bread of life was coming into the world to be born in the, in the house of bread. Verse 5, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, she being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. We are not told how long or how soon the birth occurred, after the arrival of Mary and her husband at Bethlehem, 
The scriptures make it sound like as soon as they arrived in Bethlehem, she gave birth. She was probably there a few days or weeks, which would have given people their time to help her out with the birth. Now, a lot of the videos that we see, movies and so on, show it as if um, as soon as they arrive, you know, that they're frantically looking for a place to, to have the birth and that, that it happens shortly after they arrive. Uh, but that's probably not uh, not how it happened. Verse 7, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was none to give room for them in the inns. Most of the visitors to Bethlehem would have been men, also the men appearing to be uncaring of Mary's situation to give her room. The word inn should be translated as guest chamber. And that's by Bruce R. McConkie. Others believe this means that the guest room was already occupied. Arrangements were made for Mary to give birth in another part of the house, presumably the family room. Mary and Joseph had returned to Bethlehem to register for the Roman tax because it was the homeland of their families. With many relatives living in Bethlehem, it would have been unthinkable for Mary and Joseph to seek a public inn, if indeed one even existed there. In that small village, family members would not have expected or accepted such a rejection of their hospitality, especially in view of the imminent birth of a firstborn child. That was mentioned by Kenneth Bailey in The Manger in the Inn. Elder, again, Russell M. Nelson in the BYU devotional at BYU. This is in December of 2002. He said, let's pause to ponder this verse. We need to be aware of the culture of that time and region, and we need to learn one word from the original Greek text. In the Greek New Testament, the root that, from which in was translated is kataluma. We don't have an equivalent word in the English language. The Greek prefix kata, or kata, C-A-T-A, means a breaking down. We see it in English words such as catabolism, catastrophe, and cataclysm. When the prefix kata was joined with the suffix luma, it meant literally a breaking down of a journey. A cataluma was a guest chamber in a lodging place. In those days, an inn was not like a holiday inn or a Bethlehem Marriott. A lodging place in that part of Asia had to provide accommodations for traveling caravans, including the people and the animals. Caravans stayed at what was then known and still is known as a caravansary or a con. You may look in your own dictionary and find caravansary and con each defined as a rest house in some Asian countries. Such a facility is typically rectangular in shape. It has a central courtyard for the animals that is surrounded by walled cubicles where the people rest. These quarters allowed guests to be elevated slightly above their animals with open doorways so that owners could watch over their animals. The Joseph Smith translation of Luke 2, 7 indicates that there was no room for them in the inns, plural, suggesting that all of the catalumas or cubicles of the caravansary were occupied. In the Greek New Testament, the word cataluma appears in only two other passages translated in each instance, not as an inn, but as a guest chamber which fits the concept that we have discussed. As a youngster, whenever I heard those words, no room in the inn, I assumed that no vacancy signs were posted at local motels or that innkeepers were inhospitable or even hostile. Such an assumption is probably way off the mark. People of that part of the world were no doubt then as they, as they are now most hospitable. Particularly would this have been true at a season when the normal population of Jerusalem and neighboring Bethlehem would be swollen with large numbers of relatives. At a caravansary, animals were, were secured for the night in the center courtyard. In that courtyard, there would have been donkeys and dogs, sheep and possibly camels and oxen, all with all the animals' discharges and odors. Because the guest chambers surrounding the courtyard were filled, Joseph possibly made the decision to take or to care for Mary's delivery in the center courtyard of a caravansary among the animals. There is that lovely circumstance, the Lamb of God was born, or in that lowly circumstance, the Lamb of God was born. Everyone took strangers into their homes, fed them, washed their feet, and cared for their beasts of burden. They arrived late in the day, otherwise there would have been a place for them. This was not an inn, but a con or place of lodgment for strangers or caravanners lodged for the night. It may have been a large bare building built of rough stones surrounding an open court in which animals could be tied up for the night. These rooms are public and without furniture. A traveler would, have, would also have to bring his own food, attend to his own animals, and draw water from a nearby spring. In the area of Bethlehem, sometimes the whole con, sometimes only a portion where the animals were kept, was located within a large cave, of which there are many in the area. And that's by uh, Bruce R. McConkie in Mortal Messiah. 
Bible scholars not of our faith have said that the shelter within which Jesus was born was that one of the numerous limestone caves which abound in the region and which are still used by travelers as resting places. Uh, and that was by uh, and that was uh, by Jesus in Jesus the Christ by Elder Talmage. He also said we cannot reasonably regard this circumstance as evidence of extreme destitution. Doubtless it entailed inconvenience, but it gives us no assurance of great distress or suffering. Also, uh, in another um, study some, by some Bible scholars, the inn at Bethlehem was the original home of Boaz. It came by inheritance to David, who built a fortress there. It was then sold and became an inn, but by Jewish law, after 50 years, property sold reverts to the original family. Therefore, Joseph probably owned the inn or the caravansary in Bethlehem. Joseph and Mary were not poor. They were of royal blood and owned much property in Bethlehem and Nazareth. However, they may have been land rich and cash poor. There were two types of inns in those days, ones with innkeepers and those without. This inn was without an innkeeper. There was no separate rooms, only four walls and a roof. The lower section of the inn was for the traveler's animals. The cave nearby the inn was sometimes used for overflow for the animals. It could be made clean with fresh straw and offered some privacy. This was also the cave where David may have been anointed king of, uh, of Israel generations earlier. By Jewish custom, a child born in an inn belonged to all those in the inn, and they were to provide gifts for that child. A child born in a palace belonged to the kingdom, and a, a child born in a stable belonged to everyone. There is much debate as to the actual date also of the birth of Jesus. Elder Talmage said, We believe that Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem of Judea, April the 6th, B.C. 1. He was born at Passover, or the first full moon, after the first day of spring, which um, in our time frame, also April the 6th, 1830, was also the first full moon after the first day of spring and Passover. Also, what is a manger and what was it made of? In Palestine, animals were fed in stone troughs. Even the resting place of the infant Jesus was symbolic. The rock of Israel laid in a stone crib. So it, it's not, it may not have made out of wood like we often see in pictures and in movies. The shepherds and the angels. Verse 8, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. These were not ordinary shepherds, but those watching over the sheep, destined for sacrifice on the great altar in the Lord's house. There were many shepherds in Palestine, but only to those who watched over the temple flocks did the herald angel come. Only they heard the heavenly choir. And that's again by Bruce R. McConkie. And lo, an angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. But the angels said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. This tiding was also given to King Benjamin by an angel. Remember that in Mosiah chapter 3 it says, I am come to declare unto you the glad tidings of great joy. For behold, the time cometh and is not far distant that the power, the Lord omnipotent, that with power the Lord omnipotent who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay and shall go forth amongst men working mighty miracles such as healing the sick raising the dead, causing the lame to walk, the blind to receive their sight, and the deaf to hear, and curing all manner of diseases, and all, and he shall cast out devils, or the evil spirits which dwell in the hearts of the children of men. And lo, he shall suffer temptations, and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more than man can suffer, except it be unto death. For behold, blood cometh from every pore, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness and the abominations of his people." And he shall be called the Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the Creator of all things from the beginning. And his mother shall be called Mary. And lo, he cometh unto his own, that salvation might come unto the children of men, even through faith on his name. And even after all this, they shall consider him a man, and say that he hath a devil, and shall scourge him, and shall crucify him. And he shall rise the third day from the dead, and behold, he standeth to judge the world. <clears throat> and behold, all these things are done, that a righteous judgment might come upon the children of men. Back to uh, Luke for, in verse 11. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is the way ye shall find the babe. He is wrapped in swaddling clothes and is lying in a manger. The swaddling clothes and the manger were not a sign which would identify Jesus. The angel was merely describing where he was and how he was dressed. Again, Elder Russell's, uh, Russell M. Nelson's talk 
uh, at BYU. He said, why was reference made twice in Luke 2 to his being wrapped in swaddling clothes? What is the meaning of those five words, wrapped him in swaddling clothes? I sense a significance beyond the use of an ordinary diaper and receiving blanket. Instead of those five words in the English text, only one word is needed in the Greek New Testament. That word is spar- sparganu, which means to envelop a velop- to envelop a newborn child with special cloth strips of which were passed from side to side. The cloth would probably bear unique family identification. That procedure was especially applicable to the birth of a firstborn son. His wrappings surely would have been distinctive. I think that such a concept of a cloth with family markings might also have been relevant when Joseph, son of Israel, became an, uh, the birthright son and received the unique cloth coat of many colors, a fabric symbolic of the birthright. Um, also, let me uh, read a few things here. Uh, there, when I was uh, early, when we first moved to Rockland, there was a brother in our ward named Brent Sloan, and he gave a talk once in sacrament meetings from some research that he had done uh, regarding uh, the swaddling clothes that I'm going to read to you. And also, this is uh, by findings that were done by Marie Nielsen Schreiner and Madame Lydia M. von Finelstein Mountford, uh, not members of the church. All babies were wrapped in swaddling clothes, and many were laid in a manger. How were the shepherds going to be able to tell which baby was the one spoken of by the angels? Mary wore a royal blue outer cloak, signifying her royal blood. She laid this upon the straw in the manger. Over this went her white mantle, which, with the golden candlestick embroidered upon it, signifying that she had been dedicated to the Lord, a candlestick of the Lord. The child was laid directly upon this. He was carefully wrapped in special symbolic swaddling clothes. First, as Jewish custom dictated and good mothers adhered to, the child would have have a strip of blue and white cloth with his royal genealogy embroidered in silver, signifying a son of royal birth. The second strip would also be blue and white with the paternal genealogy embroidered in silver. The third strip would be red, signifying the blood of Moab, for he was a, a descendant of Ruth, there would be a white strip embroidered in silver with Genesis chapters 1 and 2. There would be two more white strips embroidered with the tree of life and the tree of good and evil, representing the choices one makes in life. The next strip would be strips, stripes of many colors, as after Joseph's coat of many colors, signifying that this child would become the head or chief of his family. The last strip would be the shepherd's plaid, boxes of gold and white, for David was a shepherd and Christ a descendant of David and considered a shepherd. Down to to verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill to men, or among men who are righteous. Verse 15. And it came to pass, when the angel... Angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds and one said one to another, Let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing, which is come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste. The shepherds didn't wait. They went immediately. Bethlehem sat upon the top of a hill. So when the shepherds looked at Bethlehem from their flocks, they would have been looking up as we look up today to the Lord. They found Mary and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, or when they had seen, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. We also should make known abroad the restored gospel in our day that Jesus has come again. All they who heard it wondered or marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things which they had heard and seen as they were manifested unto them. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived. Jesus is presented in the temple, verse 22. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished... Now, what this means is that there was a a period of purification of about 40 days for a male child and 80 days for a female child. And so they would have taken care of that before coming to the temple. They brought him to Jerusalem. It was about five or six miles from Bethlehem to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male which openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. All firstborn sons had to be redeemed from service in the sanctuary. Elder Talmadge said, In remembrance of, his, of, the, of this manifestation of power, the killing of the Egyptian firstborn, the Israelites were required to dedicate their firstborn sons to the service of the sanctuary. 
Subsequently, the Lord directed that all males belonging to the tribe of Levi should be devoted to this service labor, and, or to this special labor, instead of the firstborn in every tribe. Nevertheless, the eldest son was still claimed as particularly the Lord's own, and had to be formally exempted from the earlier requirements of service by the paying of a ransom. And that was, uh, again, by James E. Talmadge. Verse 24, And to offer a sacrifice according to that which is written in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Every mother was supposed to furnish a yearling lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or dove for a sin offering. But in the case of any woman who was unable to, prov to provide a lamb, a pair of doves or pigeons might be offered. We learn of the humble circumstances of Joseph and Mary from the fact that they brought this less costly offering of two doves or pigeons instead of one bird and a lamb. That was by James E. Talmadge. The modest temporal circumstances of Joseph and Mary are apparent from their presentation of the less costly sacrificial offering. That was by Bruce R. McConkie. Verse 25, And behold, there was a man at Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. Uh, Elder McConkie says that Simeon was a prophet. Verse 26, And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he up, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten, or for revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. And Joseph and Mary marveled at those things which were spoken of the child. And Simeon blessed them, and said unto Mary, Behold, this child is set, up, is set or appointed for the fall and rising again of many in Israel, and for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yea, a sword shall pierce through him to the wounding of thy of thine own soul also, that the soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. And there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived a hundred, or had lived lived with a husband only seven years, whom she married in her youth. And she lived a widow about fourscore and four years, who departed not from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. Assuming that she married at the age of 12, which is possible in the East, Anna thus would have been at least 103. That was by Elder McConkie. Verse 38, And she coming in that instant gave thanks likewise unto the Lord, and spake of, and spake of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. And when, they had to, and when they had performed all things according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city. That's verse 39. Now we'll go to Matthew chapter 2. The visit of the wise men. Verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. Elder McConkie has said, As to the men themselves, one thing is clear. They had prophetic insight. It was with them as it had been with saintly Simeon. The Lord had revealed to them, as it were, that they should not taste death until they had seen and worshipped the Christ. They knew the king of the Jews had been born, and they knew that a new star was destined to arise and had arisen in connection with that birth. The probability is they were themselves Jews who lived as millions of Jews then did in one of the nations to the east. An unspecified number of wise men, therefore, whether they were two, three, or twenty in number is a matter of pure speculation. To suppose they were members of the apostate religious cult of the Magi of ancient Media and Persia is probably false. Rather, it would appear that they were true prophets, righteous persons like Simeon, Anna, and the shepherds to whom deity revealed that the promised Messiah had been born among men. It may be possible that while Lehi was in Arabia, a period of eight years, he taught the people near where they lived. If so, he would have taught them that the Messiah was coming 600 years after his departure from Jerusalem. However, he would not have known the city of the Messiah's birth because Micah's prophecy was written after Lehi left Jerusalem, and he would not have had it. These, however, would have been Arabian Jews. According to the Bible Dictionary, frankincense comes from Arabia. The Bible Dictionary also says that myrrh is from Arabia and eastern Africa. In uh, Isaiah 60, verse 6, it says, all they, who, all they from Sheba shall come, they shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. 
Sheba was southern Arabia. So Bountiful, where Lehi lived for eight years, is thought to be in southern Arabia. So the people that uh, later became des descendants of these people that maybe that Lehi knew may have known somewhat about the birth of Jesus because he may have taught them that. Again, that's speculation, and we don't know that for sure, but that's a possibility. That's a, that may be how these uh, Arabian Jews may, may have known about this. Verse 2, saying, Where is the child that is born, the Messiah of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. In Numbers chapter 24, it says, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise up, or shall rise out of Israel. And maybe the prophets interpreted that to mean that a new star would arise at his birth. Bruce R. McConkie said, As to the star, there is nothing mysterious about it. The wise men were not reading portents in the skies, nor divining the destinies of men by the movement of celestial bodies in the sidereal heavens. The new star was simply a new star of the sort we are familiar with. No doubt it exhibited an unusual brilliance so as to attract special attention and so as to give it a guidance to those who walked in its light, but it was nonetheless a star. Hugh Nibley uh, believed that the new star was most likely a supernova. He suggested that the light was due to a supernova. He notes that there was such a supernova exploded, or the, a supernova recorded in 1054 AD that could be seen all over the world. It was almost as bright as the sun. The supernova exploded and became the Crab Nebula today. In Helaman chapter 14, verse 5, it says, And behold, there shall a new star arise. Our Lord's birth into mortality was accompanied by the appearance of a new star in the heavens. It is apparent that another prophet, or perhaps even a number of prophets in the old world, had also prophesied of this sign. For when the wise men arrived in Jerusalem seeking the Messiah of the Jews, they said, We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. The statement seems to assume that the Jews of Jerusalem were aware that a new star would, would bear record of the holy birth, as at least the leaders were that the birth itself would take place in Bethlehem. After the wise men had, made, had been questioned by Herod, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. There is no Old Testament prophecy on this aspect of the Savior's birth, that is comparable to that of Samuel the Lamanite. The nearest allusion is found in the prophecy of Balaam, who, speaking of the Messiah himself, said, There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And that's the one I quoted before from Numbers. This prophecy obviously refers to the first coming of Christ, but does not announce itself as indicating a sign of his birth. The only other related pa passage is in the book of Revelation, where Christ refers to himself as the bright and morning star. The appearance of a star or a phenomenon of light accompanying the birth of one destined to be a significant role in history is a common motif in the literature of the ancient Near East. Such legends are but the dim reflection of the lost prophecy of the, law of the star that was to announce the Messiah's birth. And that's uh, in the doctrinal commentary of the Book of Mormon. Such an one as you never have beheld, and this also shall be a sign... Unto you, Elder McConkie said, Enlisting the signs to attend the birth of Jesus, Samuel the Lamanite prophesied, There shall a new star arise, such an one as ye never have beheld. That this new star has, was seen by the whole Nephite nation at the actual time of the heavenly birth is also recorded in the Book of Mormon. There is, however, no comparable messianic prophecy in the Bible as we now have it. The nearest allusion to such is found in the prophecy of Balaam that I've read before. There can be little doubt that others besides the Nephites knew by revelation that great signs and wonders, including the rise of a new star, were to attend the Messiah's birth. The language of the wise men upon reaching Jerusalem clearly assumes that the Jews were just as aware that a new star would, would bear record of the holy birth as they were that the birth itself should take place in Bethlehem. Verse 3, When Herod the king had heard of the child, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded or inquired of them, saying, Where is the place that is written of by the prophets in which Christ should be born? For he greatly feared, yet he believed not the prophets. And they said unto him, and they said unto him It is written by the prophets that he should be born in Bethlehem of Judea. For thus have they said, the word of the Lord came unto us, saying, And thou, Bethlehem, which lieth in the land of Judea, in thee shall be born a prince, which art not the least among the princes of Judea. For out of thee shall come a governor, the Messiah, who shall save my people Israel. 
Then verse 7, Then Herod, when he had called the wise men privily, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have, when ye have found the child, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, until it came and stood over where the child was. And remember, that's in the house in Bethlehem. Now they're in a house, not uh, not in a in the in the cave anymore. Uh, notice that it says young child and not baby. Verse ten: When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they came, when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. The time frame of their visit, more than seven weeks after his birth and quite possibly several months or even nearly three years, elapsed between this visit and the nativity. It could not have taken place during Mary's 40 days of purification because immediately following them, the the Holy Family went to Nazareth to live. Whereas following the visit of these three Eastern prophets, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus fled into, into Egypt for a season. It is worthy of note that the wise men found Jesus in a house, not a stable inn or temporary abiding place, that he is called young child and not a baby, a total of seven times in the course of references to the diligent nature of Herod's inquiry as to the actual time of the birth and that a child is two years of age until the time of his third birthday. Now, assuming that Herod would order the massacre of all young children in the general area or in the general age bracket involved, still the presumption arises that a number of months or even one or two years may have elapsed between the arrival of the eastern visitors. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were all expensive gifts befitting a king. Frankincense was a type of incense offered to the Lord in the temple in Jerusalem. Myrrh, which was used in embalming, may have been a prophetic indication of Christ's sacrifice. And that's from the seminary manual. Also, uh, gold was also... uh, found in uh, southern Arabia too, so that might also be an indication of where they were coming from. Verse 12, And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way, meaning that's the the wise men. They didn't go back to Herod and tell him what what they had seen. The flight into Egypt, beginning in verse 13, And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a vision, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt, and tarry there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And then he arose and took the young child and the child's mother by night and departed into Egypt. I wonder if the, the gold were, that they were given was also able to be used to buy uh, camel and provisions to be able to go into Egypt with. Verse 15, and there was and and was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt have I called my son. Since Herod is believed to have died when Jesus was two or three years old, our Lord's sojourn in that land may have been as short as a few months. We don't know for sure how long uh, they were in Egypt. Regarding the slaughter of the children in Bethlehem, verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of or deceived by the wise men, was exceeding wroth or became exceedingly angry and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. The edict to kill all boys, not children, but boys under the age of probably two, did not exceed the number of twenty. That's still a lot, isn't it? Still a lot to kill. That was by Bruce R. McConkie. Many have erroneously assumed that John's father, Zacharias, was killed between the altar and the temple in protecting John from Herod's edict. In a BYU New Testament study guide, it says that the New Testament Zacharias is the same uh, as the Old Testament Zechariah. Jesus refers to Zacharias, the son of Barachias, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. Some envision John the Baptist's father here, but this tradition of, the, of his death comes from a late Christian apocryphal book. It came into the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith by the mistake of thinking that the prophet had written a Nauvoo editorial printed when he was in exile, one clearly not by him. Another possibility for the martyr is the prophet Zechariah, whose father was Berechiah. But since there is no recorded martyrdom of this Zechariah, most scholars think that he would not be named by Jesus as a well-known case. They therefore think that Barachias of Matthew 23:35 is probably a scribal mistake. However, there was a Zechariah familiar to Jesus' audience, the son of Jehoiada, rebuked Israel, and he was stoned in the court of the house of the, of the Lord. 
And the Spirit of God came upon Zechariah, the son of Jehoiada, the priest, which stood above the people, and said unto them, Thus saith God, Why transgress ye the commandments of the Lord, that ye cannot prosper, because ye have forsaken the Lord? He hath also forsaken you. And they conspired against him, and stoned him with stones at the commandment of the king in the court of the house of the Lord. Thus Joash the king remembered not the, con the kindness which Jehoiada his father had done to him, but slew his son. And when he died, he said, The Lord look upon it and require it. And that was in Second Chronicles chapter 24, which, uh, which I'm referring to. This is basically what Jesus said. The Hebrew Bible arranged Genesis first and Chronicles last. So Jesus probably gave the first and last martyrs of Jewish scripture in his testimony. The prophet Joseph Smith is purported to have said when Herod's edict went forth to destroy the young children, John was about six months older than Jesus and came under this hellish edict. And Zacharias caused his mother to take him into the mountains when he, where he was raised on locusts and wild honey. When his father refused to disclose his hiding place and being the officiating high priest at the temple that year, he was slain by Herod's order between the porch and the altar, as Jesus said. So we know now that this quote was, was probably not an accurate quote by Joseph Smith. Uh, was made by someone else. So that's an, an inaccurate um, assumption that we're talking about Zacharias being slain. Verse 17, Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, In Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for the loss of her children, and would not be comforted because they were not. Now the reference to Rachel um, in Bethlehem, and, and Bethlehem is because that, that's where Rachel died. Uh, she was giving birth and died in childbirth and was buried in Bethlehem. Uh, returning to Nazareth from Egypt, verse 19, But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a vision to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead who sought the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came into the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the stead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. But notwithstanding, being warned of God in a vision, he went into the eastern parts of Galilee. And he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene. And it came to pass that Jesus grew up with his brethren and waxed strong and waited upon the Lord for the time of his ministry to come. And he served under his father and he spake not as other men, neither could he be taught for he needed not that any man should teach him. And after many years, the hour of his ministry drew nigh. I'm going to go back to Luke chapter 2 and begin in verse 40, talking about Jesus as a child here. And the child grew and waxed or became strong in spirit, being filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Elder McConkie, at the time of the espousement and marriage, mentions that Joseph and Mary lived in Nazareth. They traveled to Bethlehem for the birth. Jesus was circumcised in Bethlehem. After the 40 days, they traveled to Jerusalem to present Jesus at the temple. They then returned to Nazareth. They then moved to Bethlehem for an unknown reason, obtained a house there, and were there when the wise men came. Warned of God, they went into Egypt. Then, went, then after Herod's death, they planned to return to Bethlehem, but for fear of Herod's son, they went to Nazareth. Jesus lived in Nazareth probably 27 or 28 years, and that was by Bruce R. McConkie. Elder Talmadge said, He came among men to experience all the natural conditions of mortality. He was born as truly a dependent, helpless babe, as is any other child. His infancy was in all common features as the infancy of others. His boyhood was actual boyhood. His development was as necessary and as real as that of all children. Over his mind had fallen the veil of forgetfulness, common to all who are born to earth, by which the remembrance of primeval existence is shut off. The child grew, and with growth there came to him expansion of mind, development of faculties, and progression of, in power and understanding. His advancement was from one grace to another, not from gracelessness to grace, from good to greater good, not from evil to good, from favor with God to greater favor, not from estrangement because of sin, to reconciliation through repentance and propitiation. Our knowledge of Jewish life in that age justifies the inference that the boy was well taught in the law and the scriptures, for such was the rule. He garnered knowledge by study and gained wisdom by prayer, thought, and effort. Beyond question, he was trained to labor, for idleness was abhorred then as it is now, and every Jewish boy, whether a carpenter's son, peasant's child, or rabbi's heir, was required to learn and follow a practical and productive vocation. 
Jesus was all that a boy should be, for his development was unretarded by the dragging weight of sin. He loved and obeyed the truth, and therefore was free. Although Western, this is by uh, Daniel Rona, uh, a Jewish member of the church. Although Western language Bibles refer to Mary's husband as a carpenter, the Greek Bible calls him a craftsman. The industry of Nazareth was, and still is, the regional rock quarry. Joseph and hence Jesus did not just work with wood, but with stone, metal, and other elements. Most homes in the region were made from rock and stone. So Jesus was most likely not just a carpenter, but also a, a stone mason or a stone craftsman. Verse 40, 41, now his parents went to Jerusalem every year of the fe at the feast of the Passover. This is about Jesus being in the temple. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom to the feast. Elder Talmadge said, when Jesus had attained the age of 12 years, he was taken by his mother and, and Joseph to the feast at the law required, as the law required. So this is probably what we might call his bar mitzvah. Whether the boy had ever been before or present on such an occasion, we are not told. At 12 years of age, a Jewish boy was recognized as a member of his home community, and he was required then to enter in with definite purpose upon his chosen vocation. He attained an advanced status as an individual in that thereafter he could not be arbitrarily disposed of as a bondservant by his parents. He was appointed to higher studies in school and home, and when accepted by the priests, he became a son of the law. It was the custom and the very natural desire of parents to have their sons attend the feast of the Passover and be present at the temple ceremonies as recognized members of the congregation when, when of the prescribed age. Thus came the baby Jesus to the temple. Verse 43, And when they had fulfilled the days as they returned, the child Jesus tarried behind in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not that he tarried. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they sought him among his kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem, seeking him. It appears that they traveled away for a day, returned for a day, and searched in Jerusalem for a day. How would you feel if you lost one of your children? Do you think you would be more or less worried if your child was lost in your neighborhood or while you were far away from your home? If you were lost from your parents, where would your parents start looking for you? If you were missing, would your parents start searching in, in assuming that you were about God's business? Verse 46, And it came to pass, after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, or teachers, and they were hearing him and asking him questions. Elder Talmadge said, It was no unusual thing for a 12-year-old boy to be questioned by priests, scribes, or rabbis, nor to be permitted to ask questions of those of these professional expounders of the law, but such pr for such procedure was part of the educational training of Jewish youths. Nor was there anything surprising in such a meeting of students and teachers within the temple courts, for the rabbis of that time were accustomed to give instruction there, and people, young and old, gathered about them, sitting at their feet to learn. But there was much that was extraordinary in this interview, as the demeanor of the learner of the learned doctors showed, for never before had such a student been found inasmuch as all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. The incident furnishes evidence of a well-spent boyhood and proof of unusual attainments. Verse 47, And all who heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. And when his parents saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou dealt thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. Notice what she says, Thy father and I, she's referring here to Joseph, because Jesus' father wasn't looking for him, remember? Verse 49, And he said unto them, Why is it that ye sought me? Knew ye not that I must be about my father's business? So Jesus knows who his father is. Now, and then he, he, he probably is inferring here, although it's not said, he, said, he would have said, Why didn't you first look for me in the temple? Wouldn't it be nice if when our children were not with us, we could be, we could be assured that they were about God's business? We would then search for them in the most righteous of environments. His father had not been looking for him, for he was even at that moment in his father's house. He recognized as his father, not Joseph of Nazareth, but the God of heaven. That was by Talmadge. This is his first recorded testimony of his own divinity. Lorenzo Snow taught that Jesus was a God before he came into the world, and yet his knowledge was taken from him. He did not know his former greatness, neither do we know what greatness he had attained to before he, we came here. But President Snow also taught that during the Savior's life it was revealed unto him who he was and for what purpose he was in the world. The glory and power he possessed before he came into the world was made known unto him. That was in a conference talk in 1901. 
Just as the Savior came to understand exactly who he was, so may we. That was by uh, Sherry Dew. Elder McConkie explained that Jesus was an, had a normal boyhood. He was as much the product of the mother who bare him as were her other children. As a babe, he began to grow normally and naturally, and there was nothing supernatural about it. He learned to crawl, to walk, to run. He spoke his first word, cut his first tooth, took his first step, the same as other children do. He learned to speak. He played with toys like those of his brothers and sisters, and he played with them and, and with the neighbor children. He went to sleep at night, and he woke with the morning light. He learned to speak, to read, to write, to, and memorize passages of Scripture, and he pondered their deep and hidden meanings. He, he was taught in the home by Mary, then by Joseph, as was the custom of the day. Jewish traditions and the provisions of the Torah were discussed daily in, the pre, in his presence. He learned the Shema, reverenced the mezuzah, and participated in prayers morning, noon, and night. Beginning at five or six, he went to school and certainly continued to do so until he came a, a son of the law at 12 years of age. And that's by Bruce R. McConkie. Verse 50, And they understood not the saying which he spake unto them. And Elder, Elder Talmadge says, There could scarcely have been a full measure of truly human experience in the relationship between Jesus and his mother, or between him and Joseph, had the fact of his divinity been always dominant or even prominently apparent. Mary appears never to have fully understood her son. At every new evidence of his uniqueness, she marveled and pondered anew. Verse 51, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. And his, mo and his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. Here was a son who really did know more than his parents, and yet he was humble and submissive and subjected himself unto them. And then in verse 52, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Elder Talmadge said, Plainly this son of the highest was not endowed with the fullness of knowledge, nor with the complete investiture of wisdom from the cradle. Slowly the assurance of his appointed mission as the Messiah, of whose coming he read in the law, the prophets and the Psalms, developed within his, within his soul, and in devoted preparation for the ministry that should find culmination in, on the cross, he passed the years of youth and early manhood. Until the beginning of his public ministry, he appears to have been of little prominence even in the small home community. He lived the simple life at peace with his fellows, in communion with his father, thus increasing in favor with God and man. As shown by his public utterances after he had become a man, these years of seclusion were spent in active effort, both physical and mental. Jesus was a close observer of nature and man. He was able to draw illustrations from with which to point his teachings from the varied occupations, trades, and professions. The ways of the lawyer and the physician, the manners of the scribe, the Pharisee and the rabbi, the habits of the poor, the customs of the rich, the life of the shepherd, the farmer, the vine dresser, and the fisherman were all known to him. He considered the lilies of the field and the grass in meadow and upland, the birds which sowed not nor gathered into barns but lived on the bounty of their maker, the foxes in their holes, the petted house dog, and the vagrant cur, the hen sheltering her brood beneath protecting wings. All these had contributed to the wisdom in which he grew, as had other moods of the weather, the recurrence of the seasons, and all phenomena of nature change of natural change in order. Again, that was by Talmadge. Nazareth is a city atop uh, of a hill. In jo the Joseph Smith translation says, and it, and it came to pass that Jesus grew up with his brethren and waxed strong and waited upon the Lord for the time of his ministry to come. And he served under his father, and he spake not as other men, neither could he be taught, for he needed not that any man should teach him. And after many years, the hour of his ministry drew nigh. Michael Wilcox, who uh, has made several visits to the Holy Land, said this, As I look at the hills around Nazareth and across the valley to Mount Tabor, I wonder how many times Jesus climbed their summits or knelt in the woods that clothed their sides and sought his Father's will and wisdom. If it took multiple visits and teaching from Moroni and other prophets to train the prophet of the last dispensation, what kind of intense schooling would be demanded of the Savior of worlds and who would who would best him and who could it best impart those sensitive lessons? Jesus himself hinted of those early years of preparation when he said the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do, for the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. Uh, and then in John chapter 5, it says, I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. I do nothing of myself, but as my father hath taught me, I speak that which I have seen with my father. The father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, which I, what I should say and what I should speak. That was in John um, 8. And then in John 12, 
Uh, Isaiah prophetically spoke of those learning sessions. He waketh morning by morning. He waketh mine ear to hear as the learned. Mount Tabor is also the Mount of Transfiguration, or at least said so by President Kimball. Perhaps he went there because he was familiar not only with its location, but as the place where he frequently received revelations from, from his father. Although Mount Tabor is only 1,843 feet above sea level, President Kimball referred to it as the highest place on earth. The prophet Joseph Smith said, When still a boy, Jesus had all the intelligence necessary to enable him to rule and govern the kingdom of the Jews and could reason with the highest and most profound doctors of law and divinity and make their theories and practice to appear like folly compared with the wisdom he possessed. But he was only a boy, lacked physical strength even to defend his own person, and was subject to cold, to hunger, and to death. And again, that was by Joseph Smith. So I'm wondering, too, if his uh, visit in the temple with the priests, if that wasn't, uh, like I mentioned, symbolic or very much like uh, the today that the Jews uh, do their bar mitzvah, uh, where he is required to quote certain scriptures on a certain day. And so as he's in the, in the temple on the Passover, that he would have memorized those scriptures that were required for his, uh, pass or his bar mitzvah. Uh, but because Jesus, being brilliant as he was, probably, in my opinion anyway, probably had memorized all the scriptures and knew their application and their intertwinings and such, so that when the the Pharisees and doctors and lawyers and so on are asking him questions, that he's uh, most likely uh, quoting scripture that he had memorized, not just the ones for his bar mitzvah, but all of them. And that was what was amazing and astonishing to the those that were listening to him. Anyway, uh, that's the end of the lesson for today, and I hope you've enjoyed it, even though it was a long one. Uh, and that uh, talks about the birth of Jesus and his early life. Anyway, uh, that's thanks for being here, and we'll see you next time. Bye.